Wow. Faithful is our God. Worthy to receive glory and praise. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you to service today. And for everyone joining us online, thank you for logging on to be part of our service today. I'm sure you're experiencing the pound of visit of Christ. The lives will never remain the same. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So how are we today? <laughs> wow. I used to think for a long time that Jesus' death was enough for the redemption of mankind. I used to think that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. So if Jesus died, it was good enough for the redemption of mankind. But the truth is, some, most of us here knows that some other person has paid for the sin of some other people. Some people have, you know, maybe in the bid to protect someone, said, took responsibility for the sin and said, I'm the one. And people have been killed. I, I see, especially in the United States, the justice system. Because they're a bit open. You hear that a man spent 30 years for a crime that he did not commit. I'm sure you've heard of those stories before. For a crime that he did not commit, some people have spent 35 years, some people have spent 40 years. And that's the one that we, they, they could reconcile. There's so many other ones that they can't even account for. In fact, they have killed people innocently for a sin that did not commit. Am I correct? And it's happening everywhere. Miscarriage of justice. So if Jesus took her death and he, he, didn't, he didn't rise from the dead. He, he, he just died. He would just look like he was one of the martyrs who died for what they believe in. Remember, it was in Nicodemus who was telling the Pharisees that if this thing is of God, you can't stop it. It was the move, this move Jesus that we're talking about. If he's from God, you can't stop it. He said, remember, then he made references to some guys who showed up and said they were the Christ, they were doing something. He said they fizzled out. He said some scattered. He said some were killed. He said, but this one, the danger is that we'll be walking against God without us knowing. He said, be careful. That's a counsel from heaven. So I saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I have such a short time and I don't want to preach. I hope the spirit of preaching will not bounce on me. But it's a long read. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I read from verse 1. We're, we're going to practically read the whole chapter. So it's on the screen, and if you can check it in your phone, uh, your Bible, I'm using NIV version. Now, brethren, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise... You have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. Verse 5. And that he appeared to Cephas. Talking about Peter. Then to, 12, to the twelve, And verse Six, after that, he appeared to more than how many people? 500 people bear witness to the resurrected Christ. In other words, his resurrection was not hidden. It was public agenda. It wasn't hidden. He didn't appear to a few people, to some secret. This gospel is not a secret court. He said he appeared to first Peter. And then to the 12, and then to 500 brothers and sisters. Then he said, at the same time, 
and most of whom are still living. In other words, the people, as at the time they were documenting this, all the people appeared to, a large chunk of them were still alive. Though some are falling asleep. And this, this, have you noticed, Apostle Paul never made reference to death in all his epistles. He lived disregarding death. He would rather use the word falling asleep than say death. If you are very conversant with his letters, every time, remember when he was writing concerning the communion, that some of us hit the body of the Lord without differentiating between the body, you know, that it was sacred. And said, for this reason, many are weak, and they said many do what? They fall asleep. I think that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Have you noticed Jesus himself also refused to acknowledge death? He will always use the word sleep. And that's why I keep emphasizing on the power of language. Jesus read first people while he was here. The first person was um, the son of a widow. Remember, the only son of this widow. Then after that, he raised Lazarus after four days. And then the third person was this girl, 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, that Jesus, you know, visited their house and then saw people who were mourning and said, why all this commotion? Stop, stop crying. The girl is only sleeping. The Bible said that they mocked him. The same thing he told the disciples concerning Lazarus. He said... <laughs> Lazarus has fallen asleep. Let us go and wake him. <laughs> he said, if he's sleeping, he will wake up now. And the Bible said that they didn't understand him. And the last person he raised was who? Who was the fourth person Jesus raised from the dead? Huh? Jesus raised himself from the dead. He said, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to do what? Are you listening? I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to... Oh, so it didn't occur to you that Jesus was raised by Jesus. Whoever has seen me has seen who? He said, the, pa the father has life in himself and he has given the son the authority to have life in himself. Okay? And he said, the son has the power to give life to whomsoever. Why are you looking at me like this? Am I abusing you? So you didn't know that Jesus raised himself from the dead. Okay. Let me not go digress. <laughs> so let's go to verse 7. And he appeared to Peter. No, let's go on. Let's move on. We move past that. And last of all, he appeared to who? To me also. As to one abnormally born. For I am of the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Say with me, I am what I am. <laughs> by the grace of God. Say it again. <laughs> Confidently. And his grace to me was not without effect. No. I worked harder than all of them. Yes, not I. It's not me. It's the grace. He said, but the grace of God that was with me. The purpose of the grace is not for personal consumption. It's for the work of ministry. But the grace of God that was with me, whether then it was high or day, this is what we preach. And this is what you yourself have believed. Let's go on. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how come some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, if we told you, and we have preached this consistently, that Christ was raised from the dead, how come you don't believe that there's a resurrection of the dead? Because what that infer? 
is the fact that if Christ was raised from the dead, again, we made reference to the fact that Christ has raised people from the dead before. And we're saying here that how come you guys don't believe that there's a resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has, risen, has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And that's where I want to anchor this one. It looks like the preaching, the gospel we believed, is the gospel of Jesus that was not raised. That's why Christians are running up and down like headless chicken, looking for what is not lost, what has been credited into your account. What you are looking for in Sokoto is here in your pocket. Christ was raised from the dead. And his death and resurrection symbolized something. He said, that is what we believed. That's what we preached. And we believe that's what you believe as well. Except what you believe is not this one that we're preaching. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Then that makes us fake witnesses. Because we testify that Christ was raised from the dead. You see, some people believe that until they see miracles, signs and wonders, they will not believe. The truth is, believing is faith-based. It's not evidence-based. I know scripture says that without signs and wonders, they will not believe. But it is meant for those who already have the faith inside of them. Because the truth is that Christ that they saw the miracle does not mean people would believe. Jesus raised Lazarus right in front of people. How many people believed? Okay, let's assume they, they believed. How about Judas? Who was right there? Who witnessed the miracle? Did you believe? Some of you don't understand. The reason why Judas betrayed, why it was easy for Judas to betray, was that he was a non-believer. Go and check your Bible. They mix up with the crowd. They show up in church. They are leaders in church. They attend fellowship. They attend services. They do all sorts. But right in their spirit, God knows that they are not believers. Imagine Judas Iscariot with all the relationship and all the going out and coming with Jesus for three years. He was a non-believer. He didn't believe. And Bible testified to that. So signs and wonders is meant for people who already has the faith to believe. That is all about. We've seen miracles by the fathers of faith now. How many people have believed? In fact, they will say it's staged, it's stage managed. They are bribed. And because they are doing it, people do it. <laughs> they give you money behind, come and pretend that you are crippled. I remember the story of somebody they paid. <laughs> One of our brothers shared the testimony of his friend. He was paid by a pastor in church somewhere during his service, youth service, to pretend to be crippled. I don't know what happened. Was it gunshot? Bam. The cripple got up. You know, that, that story is somewhere online. Many of us have seen it. But there's a brother who bear testimony of that. He said, his friend said he did something like that for a miracle for a church. A miracle church. But I don't know. He said, he said, he asked him why did he do it. He said he was hungry. Uh, he was broke. And he needed any, anyhow money. So he pretended to to be the miracle. <laughs> the Bible says that, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, uh, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Let's go on. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins then those who also are falling asleep. See, he didn't say dead. He used the word again, falling asleep in Christ are lost. Your language positions you in the realm of the spirit. That a Christian is discouraged and he's saying it out. My mom will never say I'm broke. Oh, follow me. Even my mom, she will say money is plenty in my hand. When she says that, I know she's broke. But she will never use her mouth to confess that I'm broke. Your language places you in the realm of the spirit. And like I've always said, 
Even demons be- know when you believe. I command you in the name of Jesus. He knows whether you believe in what you're saying. When they see the authority, they respond accordingly. But when they know that you are fake, they laugh at you. If they like you. They don't like you, they pounce on you and strip you naked. Jesus, I know. Who are you? And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ and lost. Go on. Verse 18. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Wow. Interesting. So, are supposed to be the most exciting people anywhere. Anywhere. When people drag him, you see them in their fellowship. When, when they, they are smoking their thing, they take the thing from each other. Am I correct? Uh, and they drag. Okay, some, some people are looking at me as if. <laughs> okay, so I don't smoke. I would say I have never smoked before. But when I was young, we used to pick those bots, cigarette bots, you know, and try it. Some of us use paper, we roll paper. And some of us graduated, we use mat. The raft, the mat. No, thank you. That one's strong, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> By all, you don't smoke small before. <laughs> we use mats and then light because that one retains the heat, it retains the fire. And then we drag. My father smoked a lot. Smoked a lot. Until he got a point, my mom started telling him, don't smoke in the house again. And then he would smoke, he would drink from outside. When he comes, you could perceive the aroma of heaven around him. <laughs> Until he got a point, you know, he gave his life to Christ. So that's, that's the work. So, if people who are in this particular dimension, they, <laughs> they drag, they take it from one another. When we are in the spirit, it's supposed to be contagious. One person spark electricity there. Another person catches. That, that's the way it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. But it looks like we don't know what we have believed. We don't know the work of resurrection that was done, Jesus did for us. And so we look bored, not excited. And then it's a struggling. We are trying to wind you every morning, every Sunday. We are trying to wind you. Wind you. Even Sunday morning that you are supposed to show, show up in church and pretend as if you're on fire. So we can imagine what it looks like with this. You think I don't know? Guys, we are so excited. If you like, don't post on your status again. You, I will still catch you. When we are at the party and all the songs, we are excited. And that's why there's so much hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, Jesus' resurrection brought at least two benefits. At least two. I'll just mention two. And I will focus on one. Number one is newness of life and a living hope. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He in his great mercy has, he has given us new birth. New birth into a living hope. Through what? The resurrection. He gave us a new bath and he gave us what? A new hope. Through his resurrection from the dead. And not only that, he said, and an inheritance. An inheritance that can never perish. Can never be destroyed. Oh my God. So it looks like this message has been watered down. 
He looks like what we have believed. You know, I was having this conversation with my wife yesterday. I've been saying this thing for many years. Some of you who knows, okay? I've been saying this thing for many years. Is it possible that a Christian will sit somewhere and, and make a declaration that will confuse the whole nation? Is it possible? Yes. But we will never exert that power. Meanwhile, that power, he said he has given us the keys of the kingdom. So it brought two benefits, at least. New birth. So the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. And I've said it before. The new birth talks about, it's like someone just gave birth to a baby. A baby does not have a past. That's what the Bible meant when it says, all things have passed away. Babies don't have a past. And it's the same thing for us when we became born again. You don't have a past anymore. As far as justice, God is concerned. You have no past anymore. You are a brand new creature, not refurbished, not panabited. Brand new. That is enough celebration. It's enough celebration. And then he said, a living hope. It's not a hope that is dead. A living hope. A living hope. So Jesus' resurrection provided a living hope. A hope of a future resurrection. That if he conquered death, then we conquer death. Is somebody listening to me? That's why they will not give it that benefit or give it the luxury to call him death. They said, falling asleep. I remember Pastor Paul talking about what will happen. He said, if we know that um, he was dead and was raised from the dead, he said, so also those who believe will be transformed. You know, and First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, he said, we will be transformed. We will put on immortality. I've, of course, I shared extensively on that. Put on immortality and said we will fly and be caught up with the clouds. And so we will be with him. He said those who are falling asleep in Christ will first go. And then we who are alive will be transformed and then we will be caught up with him. That's why anytime I watch after and I watch Babalao doing something. It's, there's something inside of me I say, these people understand how to manipulate the supernatural. Christian, this is the dimension that we should live. We have the ability to manipulate things in the realm. We are superhuman beings. That's what he says. We know no man after the old order. <laughs> we are now new. He said, for a long time, we have known Christ in the flesh. Now, we don't know him in the flesh anymore. So whoever is concluding about you now is wrong because what they are looking at is your physical, your natural. But you are superhuman. You have the abilities of the supernatural. That was what Jesus did for us when he was raised from the dead. So he triumphed over death. And death has no power over us. Do you believe that? <laughs> do you understand the concept? What do you, what do you understand by hope? A living hope. You know what? See, when people kill themselves, when people commit suicide, it's, it's the point they get to where they become hopeless. Hopelessness is what leads to that. When a person has some measure of hope, okay, the worst you can do is to leave your country where things are not working. Even immigration is part of hopelessness. At least they lost hope in the country. But for a person to lose hope in life, they want to check out of this world. So hope itself, it's an exciting state of mind, you know, that projects, you know, a future that's exciting, a desired result in the end. Very, very important. And the Bible says hope does not disappoint. Hope does not make a shame. Let's read further. First Corinthians chapter 14. I go verse, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So Christ became the first fruit, the down payment. In other words, everyone Jesus raised from the dead died again. They died again. 
But Jesus is the only one that was raised that will never die again. So if Christ was not raised, we, we believe that he died and was not raised. So the fact that, you have you noticed that even the prayer of salvation says that you must first believe in your heart that God raised him from what? It is not enough that you believe that he died. You must believe that he was raised from the dead. And then confess with your mouth. So that confession is key. As well as the fact that he was raised from there. So Christ became the down payment. The first fruit. So what does that mean? He, he won the victory over death. The Bible says that he made a public spectacle of them. He made a public spectacle of them and triumphed over them. In it. So verse 40, 54 and 55 of that same 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So Christ abolished death. Listen. He abolished death. He has not destroyed death. The Bible says that the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He abolished death. He took the power of death. Remember in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. He said, I am the one who was dead but now alive and hold the keys of death, of grave and of death. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and Ever and I hold the keys of what? So when he conquered death, he took the key, the stink, the power, the poison, the power that death has. That was what he did. So, in the real sense of the word, the power of death is with Christ, the key. So, when children of God are afraid of death, I remember I told you when I'm driving beside a container, a container, a truck carrying the container, something will be telling me, hey, hey. Container fall on people. So every time, I'm very careful. I wait for them to... But not, not to say, that's a hold. That's how Satan starts. He introduces the idea, the seed. After a while, he grows in your heart and he, he holds you. You can't even move beside a truck. And the Bible says that the fearful, the fearful, people who are afraid, don't have a portion in the kingdom. Until after a while I come to me, ah, wait, oh, I cannot be afraid of container. See, my faith is very practical. <laughs> my faith is very practical. Tishon go bang pa yoroko tong paraba. He said, begin la. If that is killing everybody, not me. Not me. That's, that's, that's how it starts. <laughs> not me. And you know what? You say it. Ah! So he sows a seed in your heart and you've forgotten that Christ triumphed over death. He took the keys of death. He said the key is with me. Except you don't believe that in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. The keys of death. So you cannot die anyhow. You cannot die anyhow. You're traveling in a vehicle. Even if the driver is doing this, you say to yourself, see, I said it before. You can speak in tongues with fear. And it goes nowhere. It doesn't go anywhere. But you can speak in tongues from your spirit. And that's the one that works. Some people say, but the person prayed. You, you did see it supernaturally. Somebody listening to me. You like put fire on your head. When you come before the son of the living God, I would help you put it down. And water, and pour water on it. My time is almost up. Oh my God. Second Thessalonians, Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine to ten, amplified version. Second Timothy chapter one, verse nine to ten. For it is He. He delivered and saved us and called us with a calling in itself holy and leading to holiness. 
to a life of concentration, a vocation of holiness. He did it not because of anything of merit that we have done, but because of and to further his own purpose and grace, his own unmerited favor, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God ordained your salvation even before you showed up here. You're just living in the reality of the things that God designed concerning your future. If you knew that, why are you struggling? See, I keep saying it. The reason why our faith is not effective is because we have not been trained. We have not been trained. When Apostle Peter, Apostle Paul, gave his life to Christ, when he met Christ on the way to Damascus, the Bible says that for one year, 365 days, he and Barnabas were somewhere, okay, in Antioch. And they were teaching and teaching and learning about the new way. He said he didn't bother to go and get permission or approval from the people who, that have gone ahead of him. In other words, the disciples of Christ. He said, I spent 365 days teaching and understanding this new way. For three years, he said he was in Arabia. When we gave our life to Christ, we, we just became part of the mixed multitude. So people are not grounded. They don't know. And to a large extent, you can be there for the next 10, 15 years in the church. And you are not sure. I met a gospel artist some time ago who told me that she had been preaching and singing and known globally, but she was not really born again. She said when she, that it was when she got to this time that she became born again. Meanwhile, she doesn't understand the concept of being born again. So if you ask her, she said she was born again. But it, the reality now dawned on her when she came to the star. And then she met the real Christ, the real message. That's difficult to believe. So Christ died for your sins. So he gave us a new hope. But my anchor today is on the new birth. He gave us newness of life. And that's what we'll be emphasizing in Why to Live. This extraordinary living is, is the new life. Your life should not be ordinary. You see, when we talk about success, people associate success to money. No, I have said it from time to time. Once your definition is wrong, once your diagnosis is wrong, your prescription will be wrong. Success is not money. We have said it from time to time. There is an extraordinary life that Christ purchased for you. You cannot live ordinarily. Your life should not be normal. That is what the resurrected Christ did for us. Wow. Okay, so let's read um, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. Romans 6, 3 to 4. Or, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may do what? May live a new life. That's what Apostle Paul says in Rome. So the letter to Rome, that's what he said. That we were buried with Christ. When he was raised, we were raised with him. And what we were raised into is a new life, new experience. So we died to death. We died to sin. We died to sickness. We died to disease. We died to everything that is not consistent with our destiny in Christ. He said once we were baptized into his death, then we were raised into newness of life. It's a new life. And I've told you, it's a life you practice. You practice it. When a child starts, you know, um, trying to understand how to walk, you know, they, they, they hit their bum bum on the floor, they try to get up. They, they, because they've seen everybody walk on twos. They've been walking on four. They also want to be like you. So they try, they attempt. That is the same way in the kingdom. 
We have been doing too much crawling. Now it's time for us to get up. I said it last week. And a large chunk of Christians are on feeding bottle. Real meat. Real chicken. Break bone. So there's an extraordinary, extra human, extraordinary dimension, you know, of life that Christ purchased for us. It's a life that is superior to Satan. That's why I said, resist Satan. He said, he will flee. What is inside Satan when you resist? Even Satan himself does not know. But he knows that when you resist him in the name of Jesus, he flees. That's what scripture says. He's not saying demons. He said Satan. or He said, resist him. And what will happen? He said, he will flee. Practice. Everything in scripture is livable. It's livable. Wow. So it's a life that's superior. You are free from ancestral hold. You are free from the scourge of the tongue. You are free from the handwriting of ordinance written contrary to you. You are free from the hold of ancestral disease and ancestral sickness and power. Me and my wife were talking about someone who gave birth to sons who, who were blind. And I said, so was there something in the gene? You know, we're not too sure. I said, but once they gave birth to the first child, and this child was blind. I said, something should have told them subsequently that from the conception, we begin to exert superior spiritual authority. That something happened. You know something from the first one? You, you, you thought it was the second one again? Satan is a foolish guy. He's, he's a wicked guy. You give him one inch, he will go 1,000 miles. And he's not the one that says, stop, stop, I, I, I've, been, I've suffered enough. No. You resist him. Take your territory, cover your territory and say no. You can, I remember one movie that people watch. Um, is it this family live movie? When the woman came out and said, Satan, you know, war room. I, I love that scene. After, the ter after, the, after terrorizing and terrorizing, she just came to that consciousness. I said, no. I said, Satan, no more. She made a statement and then went back. Then she came back again. She said, I've not finished. That's the way we should live a life. Finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. I'm using Amplified Classic. But thanks be to God who in Christ always, always. So it is not an event that happened once and for all. It's a perpetual victory. He always leads us in triumph. As what? As what? I want us to say it out loud. As what? Let's pause there. So he leads us in triumph as trophies. If you fought a championship, whether it's in the Olympic, they give you a medal. Your medal is a symbol of your victory. So whether you won the first, second position, even that one was given different kind of medal. If you're a heavyweight boxing champion, okay, they give you a belt that you carry. So every time you display the belt, it proves that you did what? That you're the champion. What this scripture is saying is that Christ display us as trophies of his victory. But thanks be to God who in Christ always lead us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory and through us does what? Spread and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. Oh my God. So Apostle Paul enters a city. They know somebody has entered the city. You enter a city, they don't know. Even your neighborhood, they don't know. You, trophy. Trophy. I'm not talking of beer. Trophy. <laughs> and because the people who are using the brand, they understand what they're talking about. Trophy. You are a trophy of his victory. So trophies of victory are not timid. You, you cannot be adulterating. You cannot be defrauding. You cannot be conniving. You are trophies of his victory.
Trophies of his victory don't have side cheeks. And they don't have cockerels. Are you listening to me? Trophies of his victory. No. They have a victorious, righteous life imputed into them. They're not compromised. Trophies of his victory. Christ should be able to brag. Try Uche. He will stand. And it's not because of the things I've given him. God was bragging about Job. That was why they, because it was supposed to be trophy. Are you listening to me? And not only that, we dispelled, we dispersed, I, I attended uh, a fragrance exhibition yesterday somewhere, or factories, somewhere at the junction of Montgomery. They have a whole week event there. And it, it, was, it was a beautiful experience because there was unusual aroma. For the first time, it just occurred to me how God intentionally tell people in the Old Testament to do certain, certain, certain aroma, certain spice, to mix it up, to create a fragrance. People have fragrance, dirty fragrance. But people put on another fragrance. And that's when somebody enter here now. Hmm, hmm. Some people have so branded themselves with the fragrance. Meanwhile, the fragrance of God, they are not interested in. You are trophies of his victory. You don't have Aristo. Christ is your Aristo. An aristocrat. Trophies of his victory are not unfaithful to their spouses. Trophies of his victory are faithful. They have faithfulness in their genes. They are loyal. Trophies of his victory. They don't sleep with people who they are not married to. How are such? It's in the church. The people purchased by the blood. Jesus cannot even say, so you, you is not sure if he should display you or position you. Or show you off as his trophy of victory. Trophies of victory don't beat their spouses. They don't abuse their spouses. I didn't read anywhere in the Bible that Abraham beat Sarah. And they were fighting. And Sarah bite him. I don't know where you got your own from. Why? Long suffering and patience is in our gene. Bring it out. It's in your gene. Capacity to love. To endure. To long suffer. To love and shield. They don't abuse physically. They don't abuse verbally. They don't abuse emotionally. Fragrance of his grace and trophies of his victory don't abuse children. They don't abuse us girls and us boys. I don't know what's sexy about a 12-year-old, a 6-year-old, a 2-year-old baby that people abuse. Something is wrong with them. And it's not a demon. It's more than a demon. It's a legion. That they taught children. Happy children. I was telling my wife, I said, there's a reason why God said in the Old Testament they should bring people out and store them publicly. Maybe we should return to that day and castrate people publicly. I was talking, uh, uh, I was talking to a counselor. She told me, Pastor, you don't have an idea of them of the size of abuse in the church. She's a counselor. She was telling me about her experience. I said in the church. Maybe that's why one brother will kill and his sister. Christian. Christian. Children of God. We're now beating ourselves to death. What have we believed? What have we believed? I we talked about a very funny marriage, Nabal and Abigail. And the Bible said that folly was the name of Nabal. Yet, they didn't document that he beat his wife, that he abused his wife, or she abused her husband. Trophies of his victory cannot be abusive. You are the boss, and you talk to people anyhow, and you call yourself a child of God. Something is wrong with you. 
you are supposed to be fragrance of love. You can't hold people's destiny. Say, sleep with me before compromise on their values because you hold the key or you have some measure of authority over their destiny. What's wrong with us? Bible says that David wanted to kill Nabal and his wife stepped in and helped the situation. But the next day, the woman told her husband what happened, that David was going to come and kill everybody, all the male in this house. But thank God for intervention. She didn't say more than that. Bible said that his heart sank. And then Bible says after that, who killed him? God killed Nabal. God killed Nabal. God killed Nabal. He's the same yesterday, today. He's the only one that doesn't change. God's nature does not change. So we think that this dispensation of mercy gives us latitude for all sort of nonsense. You don't abuse people. You cannot change the contract midway like Laban if you are a child of God. If you sign an agreement with people, honor the agreement, whether it pays you or not. You cannot change the agreement halfway. It is satanic. It's from the pit of hell. And we say everybody is doing it. It's not. You belong to a different kingdom. You are a new creature. You don't do that. You don't promise what you cannot deliver. We have not been saying this thing long enough. But that's the truth. You don't. Trophies of Christ, they are not cruel. We are kind. We are kind people. You pick up that baggage from growing up. It's not. For the men who attended the men's program, they said temperament is the software that God put inside of us on how to respond to life. He said, but most of the time, it catches virus. A lot of people carrying virus that need to be the virus. You have not even installed antivirus in your system. So that's why it makes us malfunction and misbehave. Trophies of Christ's victory are disciplined. I will be there 10 o'clock. You are better than the white man. If, you know, apologies, you know, I'm not saying it to derogate, but I'm saying, so even in developed countries, they're so respectful of time and other people's time. Here, we say it's African time. Meanwhile, it's only Nigeria here. They don't do it in other African countries. Trophies of God's victory. Let God be proud of you. Let him show you off. Very, very important. Trophies of victories are not slave masters. We don't take advantage of people, and particularly children, or the female, or the weak. We don't use people. We don't slander. We don't destroy. We don't scheme because we know that he has our future in his hands. Somebody listening to me. Trophies of his victory don't dress anyhow. We don't dress anyhow. We don't, we don't, we don't try to pattern like the rest of the world is doing. We're different. Christians now dress anyhow. We're showing body and showing cleavage, and nobody's talking. And we, all sorts of elements that we imported into the body, into the kingdom of God. You don't. We don't embarrass our Heavenly Father. We are the light and the salt of the earth. We are not unruly. We are not uncultured. We are not undisciplined. That is the trophies of his victory. That's what Christ purchased on the cross. Trophies of his victory don't consult witches and wizards. You don't go and seek protection anywhere. Your protection is Psalm 91. That he gave you something to put in the house, put in the car, put in, you have lost protection. Anything outside of this world, all the faith extenders that people are using, are using candle that is not documented in the Bible because you want to provide light for the Holy Spirit to see road because it's blind. 
light. Trophies check the scriptures and check if things are consistent there. See, God knows who are his. Satan knows who are God's. And he knows his own as well. And we also know where we stand. I'm telling you the truth. Trophies are ten fellowships. Trophies of God which are ten fellowships. They are ten fellowships. Trophies of victory are a blessing. They are ten church service. They are a blessing to others. You don't use people. Finally, trophies don't contribute to the decaying society. Because everybody's doing it. The day that a, a parent becomes super embarrassed is the day your child takes you public and embarrass you. You know, all these things that they are doing in the house, sometimes you get to a point that they don't know the boundaries anymore. They come outside. I was attending a funeral service during the week in Abeokuta. And this child sat in the middle <laughs> of the compound and was crying. And they were begging the child. I felt like kicking her to open the door inside. You don't know the disposition that they meet. A child that you do not train the house will embarrass you in the public. And that's how many of us have been embarrassing God. Satan is saying, who? Who? And God cannot say, go and take him out because it will be, it will be, it will be brutal. You know, it's that it will be brutal. So it's just the grace that is covering you. And that's why we have a messed up society. We have a messed up country. And the Christians are there. We don't see the light. We don't see the salt. We're part of the decay. If God allowed me to live 75, 80, 90, 100, fine. But this life, this life, I have only one chance to live it. And I don't care how long, as long as it's about the purpose and the counsel of God. I've told, I've told my wife. That's the reality. We are trophies of his victory. You're purchased. With a price. You don't own your life anymore. He owns your life. If you can't live that, you can surrender your life. I mean, collect your life back. And it's better. So you know where you start. He said, the love for this world is enmity against God. And I understand the pressure and dimension in our society. But that's where the problem is. Because the Christians have not been shining your light. That's why we look helpless and powerless. And we are only just hoping. Hoping that something will change. When it has given us the power to change things. You have the power. Say to yourself, I have the power. You have the power to change the course of your life. You have the power to impact your environment. You have the power to influence things you have. Living the life that is not yours. The life that I live now. I live by the faith in the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. By your heads, let's pray. Thank you, Father. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God this morning. Talk to him the way you want. Thank you, Father. Thank you, faithful God. Father, we bless your name. We celebrate your victory today. We glorify your name. We magnify you. Thank you, Father. I want to pray for someone in this service. You want to give your life, you want to start a relationship with the Father. You don't have relationship with him. You want to want to start a relationship with him. God has been waiting for you to make that decision. You have the opportunity now. Because after now, you are not sure. You want to make a decision for Jesus? Can you put one hand on your chest, whether it's auditorium, or you're connecting with us online? 
God wants to show you off. He wants to display you as the trophies of his victory. Put one hand in your chest and lift the other hand and say with me, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you were raised on the third day. I believe that you are seated on the right hand of majesty, interceding for me. Accept you as my Lord and Savior today. And I ask that you come into my heart and fill me with your life. I believe Jesus is the Son of God and I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Write my name in the book of life and I'll live all my life for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, for your sons and daughters who are making this decision. I ask, Holy Father, that your power will come upon these ones and fill them with your very power, your very presence, your grace, and your glory. Transform them and translate them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Thank you, faithful, marvelous Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Said in Jesus' name, we pray.